For over 10 years, confidence in America's highest political office had been shaken. Assassination, impeachment, corruption. Then with the election of Rutherford B. Hayes in 1876, the electoral process itself would be scandalized in the most disputed election in American history. A congressional commission was appointed to decide the outcome. Coming in under a cloud, there was a lot of jokes about Rutherford B. Hayes. He was sometimes known as old eight to seven because of the vote of the commission, eight to seven for him, or by unkind critics as Rutherford B. Hayes. As president, Hayes withdrew federal forces that had occupied the South. It was the formal end of Reconstruction. The era of Jim Crow and segregation had begun. A man of probity, Hayes tried to set a moral tone for the nation. His wife Lucy was a temperance supporter who would not serve liquor in the White House. She's serving non-alcoholic drinks and they're calling her Lemonade Lucy. Uh, I don't think Hayes himself would have gone that far, but he was a moralist. He viewed himself as, as a, an ethical person, as an honest person. That's the persona that he pre presents to the country. Not all followed the president's example. Gangs of bandits roamed the Wild West. Some became celebrities. When members of the infamous Jesse James gang were captured, a fascinated public bought 50,000 souvenir cards of the Desperados in a single month. The Hayes years were marked by dazzling leaps in technology. Thomas Edison, the wizard of Menlo Park, New Jersey, produced two of his greatest inventions. In his laboratory, Edison's team of inventors created the phonograph and the electric light. The lure of success in America was attracting people the world over. By the end of Hayes' term, massive immigration from Europe, and to a much lesser degree from China, would push America's population to 50 million. The immigrants represented diverse cultures and were used as a cheap source of labor. Troubling new issues were emerging. Urban squalor, prejudice, workers' rights. When his term ended, Hayes retired to his Spiegel Grove home in Fremont, Ohio. While on a trip, Hayes became gravely ill, but insisted on returning to Fremont. He said, I would rather die at Spiegel Grove than live anywhere else. Three days later, he was dead. Leadership was to gather the information, consult the proper advisors, make a decision. Once a decision is made, try not to look back and be decisive. When Hayes took office, the country was still dealing with the legacy of post-Civil War reconstruction. Federal troops were stationed in the state houses of South Carolina and Louisiana to protect black-supported Republican governments from takeover by the Democrats, who were mostly ex-Confederates. In the most controversial act of Hayes' presidency, he ordered the removal of the troops from the state houses, clearing the way for Democratic takeover of the last two southern states still under Republican rule. It was the symbolic end of Reconstruction. Some historians see this as a consummation of the backroom deal made during the disputed election. In the so-called Great Compromise, Republicans allegedly agreed to give up control of the South if the Democrats would rescind their opposition to Hayes becoming president. Basically, you've got to exchange Republican control of the White House in exchange for Democratic control of the state governments of now the entire South. Hayes has been vilified for his complicity in the deal, agreeing to end Reconstruction in exchange for the presidency. But historians point out that the Great Compromise of 1877 isn't exactly what it appears. The election of Hayes is taken very often as the ending of Reconstruction, but Hayes represented the faction of the Republican Party which wanted to end Reconstruction. And his nomination shows that the Republican Party was already retreating from further intervention in the South to protect the rights of black people. So the bargain or the compromise of 1877, which finally puts Hayes in the White House and is sort of the point at which Reconstruction ends, is an important moment, but it's also the culmination of a 
trajectory which has taken place for several years before that. Hayes was already interested in a new approach to the South. He was convinced that the return of civilian rule would bring with it a return of civility. Hayes believed that if what was often called the best men, the better sort, the well-to-do Southern whites came back into power, even as Democrats, that they would, in a sort of paternalistic way, protect blacks from violence and recognize their basic rights. He was shocked when that didn't happen. This was probably the biggest disappointment to Rutherford Hayes because he really felt betrayed by the former Confederate leaders because they were supposed to be officers and gentlemen. Regardless of how the decision had been made, under Hayes's watch, the window closed on Reconstruction, dooming blacks in the South to years of segregation and deprivation, and keeping the old Confederacy a white man's country for another hundred years. For better or worse, the great issues of the age had been settled. And as the Civil War faded into memory, the reformers in Hayes' party were in search of another defining issue. Some people thought that civil service reform would be as important as anti-slavery had been. I have never quite understood that. The civil service meant government jobs, like postal officials and tax collectors. These positions were used by politicians to exert influence and extort cash. There's no income tax. One of the largest ways of the federal government to collect taxes was on customs duties. And most of U.S. imports and exports came through or went out of the Port of New York. So the collector of the Port of New York was a really significant position in the federal bureaucracy at this time. The New York Custom House was the biggest source of patronage in the country. And consequently, it tended to be quite corrupt. Appointments to the Custom House, including the position of Chief Collector, were controlled by New York's corrupt political machine, namely the so-called Republican stalwarts led by Senator Roscoe Conkling. In one of the few decisive moments of his presidency, Hayes removed the head of the Custom House, who was a Conkling crony, and replaced him with someone of merit. But the deposed crony would not have long to lick his wounds. His name? Chester A. Arthur who, against all odds, would become president himself within three years. In the final year of his presidency, Hayes became the first sitting president to travel to the West Coast, a move he hoped would bring unity to the country. Despite some calls for him to run again, he honored a campaign pledge not to seek a second term. He said no, he had enough. He really didn't like the presidency very much. In his typical, positive way, Hayes was quite proud of the accomplishments of his administration. He thought he was the best president since John Quincy Adams, with the exception of Lincoln. Hayes retired to his home in Fremont, Ohio, where he spent the last years of his life working tirelessly for education reform and civil rights for black Americans. In doing so, he set a standard for future ex-presidents. Three different presidents occupied the White House in 1881, Rutherford Hayes, James Garfield, and Chester Arthur. 